Welcome everyone to our Q&A session from the Book of Romans. Uh, thank you once again for joining us this evening. Um, whether you're joining us on Facebook Live or whether you're joining us on our church online platform, we welcome you. Thank you for being here this evening. Um, today we're doing something slightly different, of course. We're not just going to hear me talk for the most part from the book of Romans, uh, we have a Q&A night. And uh, if you're just joining us on Facebook Live or if you are joining us on a church online platform, um, if you look at the information about this particular uh, video on Facebook or if you look at the description of the um, church online platform video, you will see a link to an app called... Uh, app.slide.do you know uh, it's um it's a quick app online for you to go in and put in your questions and those questions come online to me and if you see any question out there that you already like that you would like prior prioritized you can upvote it and then that kind of goes to the top and then i kind of tackle those questions up front okay so i just want a quick confirmation from one of you that you can hear me and if I get that, then we'll open in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Um, just uh, once again, a reminder, if um, you are, if you want to put in those questions and you would like to upvote the questions or if you would like to um, add your own questions, uh, there is a link that I'm going to ask my fellow host to kind of post in the chat comments um, and they can kind of, uh, so then if you just click that link, you can go on to our site and you can actually ask your question. So um, thanks once again for my fellow hosts, uh, the media and publication team at Windsor Gospel Assembly, um, Ruth, Ishan, uh, Jude and Benson. Thank you once again for helping me do this every Thursday. Um, as you can see, there's uh, the links being posted. Now, if you click on that link, you can go to the particular um, app and you can ask your questions or upvote any questions that you already have. And that way uh, we can stay on top of your questions and, and I can hopefully answer them to the best of my ability. Um, thank you once again for joining us this evening. Let's open with a word of prayer and we are going to dive right in. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening that you've given us. Uh, we thank you that you are here amongst us, dear God. And though these questions that have already come in, um, I pray that you will give me the wisdom to, to not just answer the technicality of it, but to understand the intention and the heart behind these questions dear God and God I know that it is not we or we humans that have all the answers it is only you and your word and your word being activated by the power of the Holy Spirit that can truly address the hearts of uh, each and every one of the questions that are asked dear God we pray that as uh, I speak Lord let your unction be upon me let your spirit guide my words God, I pray that as uh, as I kind of share my take on these questions, as we new questions come up, Lord, I pray that your spirit will do that which my words cannot, and that um, that these questions will be answered in a way where it will spark more discussion for us to dive into the word and research, and to even test for ourselves whether this is from the word of God or not. It will force us to be as the Bible says, those Barians who tested everything that was answered so that they could c confirm that it is scriptural. God, I pray for anyone that will be joining us later on or that they will be looking at this video at a later point in time. God, I pray that uh, your name will be glorified in all of that. Keep us in your care and keeping and be with me as I answer these questions. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, once again, for those just joining us, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you that you are part of uh, this interactive session that we have, that you will be sending in your question and 
You will be upvoting the questions, helping me decide which questions to tackle. Um, I will be getting started on the app based on the questions that you have. Uh, most of the questions here are along the about the Book of Romans, stuff we have already tackled from chapters 1 through chapters 8. We're right at the halfway point. Um, after our Q&A night, we'll be continuing our journey through the Book of Romans, making our way to the end and see what Paul has to say, how he ties a lot of the theoretical stuff that he has mentioned to the practicality of us uh, living our life in light of what we have learned. And we look forward to that in the following weeks. Um, but... We are just going to dive into the questions that we have. Once again, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to click on that link that has been shared on Facebook Live and on our church online platform. It will take you to a quick website where you can type in your questions. You don't have to log in. You can remain anonymous. We'll tackle the questions to the best of our ability in today's session. So um, thank you once again for joining us. Let's dive right in. Okay, so the first question that's on my list here is... Um, a question that's been upvoted by three people, which is, if God has already paid the price of sin and salvation is a gift, what is the motivation for us doing what is right? Okay, so think of it. If God has already paid the price of sin by Jesus dying on the cross, uh, and if the salvation that we enjoy is a gift, it's not something that we earn, then what is the motivation for us doing what is right? What is the motivation behind our, our actions, us trying to do the right thing. Um, what's interesting about that question is that that is a question that Paul already addresses in the book of Romans, right? And so he kind of says that where, where, grace, where sin abounded, grace abounds even more. Uh, so that's Romans chapter 6. Um, and in verse 1 of chapter 6, Paul asks the question, which is that, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? And he says, by no means, right? And so for us to answer this question, for us to understand the intent behind this question, uh, we have to ask a different question, right? Why is it that God wants to save us in the first place, right? Why is it that God actually wants to pursue a relationship with us right and if we don't answer that if we just um, answer that oh god wants to save us and let's not dive deeper than that then we can't really understand the uh, problem in wanting to live a sinful life after we have been saved right so here's here's my take on this god created us in order that we may have a relationship with him God created us in order that we may have a relationship with Him. He created us with the purpose that we will serve His purpose of creating us. That we are the painting, He's the painter, that we exist to glorify Him. right? And when sin entered the world, we separated ourselves from God. And so we could no longer function towards the purpose for which we were created. Salvation... And Jesus dying for our sins and paying the price for our sins is, is God making a way for us to go back and restore our relationship with God so that we can live towards the purposes of God. Okay, so God wants to restore um, the relationship we have so that we can meet the purpose for which we were created. And the purpose for which we were created is to exemplify um, the character of God in our daily living to to find our satisfaction in God right so the motivation for us doing what is right is just that to find our satisfaction in in fulfilling the purpose for which we were created we weren't created just so that we can enjoy this life based on what our desires are we were created so that we may enjoy this life and eternal life by living according to the um, guidelines that God set up for us. Because it is in obeying his template for us that we are most satisfied. Now, we don't agree with this a lot of times. We try to find satisfaction in other things, and that's what leads to sin. Uh, James actually writes and tells us that it is 
when each of us are drawn towards our own evil desires, that's when we are ensnared by sin. When our desires align with God, then we want to do the things that please God because that's for, that's what we were created for. We kind of addressed this last week when we talked about the law and it's not that God has just given us a new set of laws. God has set us free by transforming our minds and transforming our hearts and placing and wanting for us that our desires will align with his desires, right? So the motivation for us to do what is right is multiple, right? A, to make God happy with us, right? Because it is in doing so that we are most satisfied. B, to actually find our satisfaction by meeting the purpose for which we were created. Any particular instrument, any machine is most satisfied when it is being utilized for the purpose for which it was created. Um, we all have mobile phones. If we take our mobile phones and try to use it as a hammer, I would argue that the mobile phone will not be satisfied because it is being used to bang a nail into the wall instead of actually serving the smart purposes for which it, which it was created, to serve information, to connect people, to actually be, bring the information of the internet at our fingertips. That's what our smartphones are created for. But if we try to use it as a hammer, our smartphones will not be satisfied. In the same way we were created to fulfill the purpose of God and to be his masterpiece and exemplify to the world how good our God is. And so when we try to do other things um, against that, which is sin, um, we don't find our satisfaction. So that's another motivation. But let me also say what are not our motivations, right? So our motivation is not trying to earn our way to God. That's not why we do right. Because we can't earn our way into God's presence. We can't earn our way to salvation. It is a free gift as the question itself calls out. Uh, we do not do right out of fear that somehow God's grace is not going to cover our sin, right? We're, once again, it is which way you look at it, whether we are not doing right to earn something and we are not trying to do right in order to avoid something bad. Because in that kind of mindset, the focus is on us. We are trying to do what is right out of love for the one who created us. We are trying to do what is right because we actually want to bring pleasure to the heart of God in whatever way we can. And that is our motivation. So as I answer this question, I, wa I want to tie a lot of our questions to the practical side of things. And I want to tie this to us understanding that, that we can use this as an evaluation tool of ourselves. A lot of times we say that, oh, why do we do this? Oh, because it's the right thing to do. Technically, that's the right answer. I understand it's the right thing to do. But we've got to go beyond that. We've got to ask that, yes, it is the right thing to do. But why is it the right thing to do? Why is it the right thing to do? It is the right thing to do because it brings pleasure to the heart of the creator. It is the right thing to do because it is in line with our relationship with God. It is the right thing to do because it exemplifies to people how good God is. And it is the right thing to do because we, it, because by doing what is right, it, um, there is this confirmation in our soul by the Holy Spirit that we are living according to God. And so if those are not your motivations for doing right, perhaps we haven't grasped the, the beauty of this gospel. Perhaps we haven't really grasped that God wants a relationship with us and not just for us to somehow adhere to some arbitrary moral standard. Not that it is arbitrary, it's based on God's own character. However, that's still not the motivation behind it. Our motivation is to please God. And so hopefully that kind of answers the question. A great question. Once again, uh, if you have questions, you can continue to post them up. Upvote the questions that uh, are already there. And I will keep an eye on the most popular questions and answer that. Okay. So moving on to the next question. And this is probably a question that a um, whole bunch of people are probably going to feel that this is a controversial topic. But I want to address this question. So the next uh, 
most upvoted question on uh, our app here <clears throat> is I want to know that can only the people who are baptized are they the only ones who can partake in the bread or wine or Holy Communion or even people who accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior can have it okay so the question here is that I want to know whether a baptism um, is a prerequisite for a person to participate in the Lord's Table or the Eucharist or the Holy Communion. All of these are the name of the same thing in First Corinthians chapter 11. You know, Paul writes and Jesus reminds us in the Last Supper that do this in remembrance of me. And when we do that, is that a sacrament? Is that tradition in the churches? Is that, that what we do on a regular basis? Is that sacrament available to only those who are baptized or is it also available to those who have accepted Christ but are not yet baptized? Okay, and I know it's a straightforward question. As I said, it's a controversial question. Different denominations may answer this differently. But I want to read another question that's part of this list because I want to address them both together because they are related. Right. And the question is, can I be a Christian and not take water baptism? Okay, can I be a Christian and not take water baptism? <coughs> and I want to answer both of these questions uh, in um, in tandem because obviously you see they are linked. But I feel like if I had answer one and not the other, I will not be answering this question comprehensively. And I think that's something all our viewers and everyone who will be watching this video online later should understand that this there's multiple facets to this question. Um, but before I dive into this answer, I do want to be very clear um, that the answer I'm going to present, I have um, spoken with our church, church pastor, Pastor Monsi, and I have made sure that this is in alignment with our church leadership and uh, the headship of our leader, our pastor. And so uh, rest assured, um, this is not just me kind of making things up or just giving my opinion. Um, there's the backing of the church pastor behind what I'm going to say. And more importantly, the backing of scripture towards what I am going to say. And, and so I want you to kind of pay careful attention to what I'm going to talk uh, in the next little while. Is baptism a prerequisite for taking Holy Communion? Right. So I want to start by reading something from Romans that we have not read as yet because it is in chapter 9. We kind of step, stopped our study in chapter 8, a halfway point. But in Romans chapter 9, um, verses um, 10 and... Um, sorry, Romans chapter 10, verses uh, 9 and 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Um, this is what Paul writes for us, right? And he says... If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Okay, so before this question morphs into something else, where we start understanding that, hey, do I need baptism in order to be saved? Is baptism what saves me? It is the baptism that cleanses my sins away. Before any of that, we have to establish what is the point of salvation, right? What is the point of salvation, right? Um, and the point of salvation, as Paul answers very clearly in these two verses, is that you need to... Um, Declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus Christ is your Lord, and that you need to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Because it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. When you believe in your heart that Jesus, God has said this, I believe it, that's your belief justifies you. That's what we read about Abraham, that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, right? And so if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, that God raised him from the dead, that's one part. And the other part is for you to declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. 
Okay, so accepting Christ is a matter of two things. You believing in your heart. Now, believing in your heart is a part where it is not just like, oh, I feel like it. That's not what believing in your heart is. Believing in your heart is you truly accepting to the core of your being, in your decisions, in your knowledge, in your emotional condition. You are believing that, yes, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And you believing that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Now, the word Lord is a very particular word. Lord means that he's your master. He, what he says goes. Your direction comes from him and him alone. He is the supreme authority that you answer to. That's what Lord means. And so when you believe in your heart that, Christ, that God raised Christ from the dead and you profess with your mouth what you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord, you are saved. No ifs, ands and buts, you know. No saying a sinner's prayer, no getting baptized, no wearing different kind of clothes. None of that external thing saves you. What saves you is the belief in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and that he is your Lord and Savior, that he's my Lord and Savior. When you believe that and when you confess it, to profess it so that people acknowledge that that's what you are saying, right? So when you believe and you hide it, that's, that, that means your belief is suspect. Why would you hide a good news, right? So now that is what salvation is, right? Now, that's salvation. What is baptism? Baptism is a matter of obedience. Baptism is you um, declaring to the world through an action that you are professing Jesus Christ as your Lord. You are declaring, as we read in Romans 6, that you are going down in the water, means you, you are dying, you're giving up your life, and when you come out of the water, that life now belongs to Jesus because you're sharing in his resurrection. This is what we covered in Romans chapter 6. You can dive back a few videos and kind of look at that. Um, but when you go down in the water and you come out, that is you accepting that you're dead to yourself. You don't belong to yourself anymore. You now belong to Jesus because you've been resurrected with him. That's what baptism is. So that is your public declaration of your faith. It is a public testimony of some, it is an external sign of something that has happened internally. So the salvation, the saving grace of God, that happens internally. The baptism is just an external sign of that behavior, of that internal change. That's a behavior level uh, proclamation of that which your heart has already believed. So that's what baptism is, right? Now, let's say you are you are believing in Christ, you have confessed, you go around telling people that, hey, Jesus Christ is my Lord, my life is transformed, His grace has saved me, I've accepted His gift, but you haven't yet been baptized because for whatever reason, right? Let's say the, you know, the baptism service is scheduled in two weeks or you have, you don't have, a, you haven't had a chance to be baptized or your church doesn't have a facility for a baptismal tank and so you've got to schedule this or you're grouping other people, baptisms that are going to happen at the end of the month, whatever the reason, right? If those are the reasons why you are, have not been baptized yet, but you've accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, I believe you can participate in the Holy Communion in the Lord's Supper because the prerequisite is that you already believe in Jesus. He is your Lord and Savior. You accept what has happened on the cross. He died for your sins. You die and you died because you've accepted Christ Jesus' new life. You identify with his death. You identify with his resurrection. You can remember what who Jesus is. You can remember his death and resurrection. And you can wait for his second coming if you believe and you confess with your mouth. And therefore you can participate in the communion, right? So, and I know a um, lot of times if you read the book of Acts, for example, the moment they believed, the mo that moment they were baptized. When they said that, okay, I believe in Jesus right now. I believe in the gospel. 
They were taken to a river, they were baptized then and there. So there wasn't this confusion whether they believed and they have not been baptized. That scenario didn't exist. That scenario does exist for us in a practical sense. But that does not disqualify you from taking the Lord's Supper. Um, so baptism is not a prerequisite for the Lord's Supper. But salvation is. Right? And I want to um, um, be very clear about this. Right, uh, Salvation is not just you saying. You actually have to believe as we just read. You actually have to be transformed. And if we read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul had lays out a very clear understanding of when we should refrain from taking the Holy Communion. It is any time that we are not accepting, we are not recognizing the body of Christ that was broken for us. And any time we are not recognizing the body of Christ in terms of the believers that surround us. If you are not in the right terms, and you, you refrain from the Holy Communion. But if you are in right terms with God, you, you, are, you are at right terms with believers, you, you've confessed, you believe that your sins are forgiven because of what Jesus has done, not because you have earned it, you can participate in the Holy Communion, and you should. Um, now, can I be a Christian and not be baptized? Because that is also another important question. And the question is important because there are certain people who, who think they can continue being a believer, but they don't want to get baptized. They don't even want to get baptized. They avoid baptism, right? And to me, the question I have for them is, what are you avoiding baptism for? Because very clearly, it is an instruction given to us in scripture. That's what the people in the book of Acts did. That's what is the tradition with modern day churches. Um, that's what Jesus himself did. right? He told John the Baptist, John the Baptist said, hey, you are the Messiah. You should be baptizing me. But he said, no, let us do this so that every requirement of righteousness is met. right? And so he himself was baptized. So baptism is something we all, once we've believed in Jesus, once we've professed our confession of him as our Lord, we must get baptized out of obedience. Now, if you don't want to get baptized, I would ask why? Is it because you don't want to publicly admit that Jesus Christ is your Lord? Is it because you are afraid? Is it because there are other circumstances? I would argue that how is it that you say that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and that he is your master, but your first decision is to disobey his commandment to take water baptism that doesn't make sense to me so so these are two different things right if you believe get baptized if you believe partake in the communion right we don't have to tie baptism and communion together but both of these are tied to your belief in Jesus and you must so you must follow in obedience to all of these things right so right how can I tie this together and to tie this together, I want to go to the book of Acts, right? I want to go to the book of Acts. And I want to, to read um, something from the book of Acts chapter 10. Book of Acts chapter 10, I want to read this. Um, and so this is where Peter um, goes and few of the people from, Jer from Joppa go to the house of... Uh, um, Cornelius, he's a Roman centurion, he lives in Caesarea, Peter goes there, Peter talks, the Holy Spirit, um, sorry, um, I'm picking the wrong example here. Um, uh, okay, sorry, I picked the wrong example there. Um, Acts chapter 16, Acts chapter 16. Uh, not uh, not Acts chapter 10, but Acts chapter 16. So this is where Paul and Silas are in prison. Okay, Paul and Silas are in prison. And we probably see, know this story that they are in prison. They are singing songs in the middle of the night. And as they are spraying and singing hymns to God, the other prisoners are listening. And suddenly there's a violent earthquake. The, the prison doors open and everyone's free to run. Like the shackles fall off, the prison doors open. They can all run and go free, but they don't run. And the jailer is trying to kill himself because he's like, if the prisoners escape, the Roman government is going to kill me. 
So he wants to kill himself, but Paul says, do not harm yourself, we are all here. So the jailer the, the, takes Paul and Silas to his home, and that day, his whole household believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so in verse 29 of, verse, of chapter 16, the book of Acts, this is a question that the Romans, um, the jailer asks Paul and Silas. Verse 30, he then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And Paul says, Paul and Silas reply, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. So what must I do to be saved? Believe in Jesus. Believe in Jesus, confess it enough. Paul says the same thing in Romans uh, chapter 10. But I'm going to jump back now to Acts chapter um, 2. Uh, Acts chapter 2, right? And I'm going to read verse 37. So this is the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit falls on them, right? Holy Spirit falls on the apostles and Peter stands up and gives the sermon about how Jesus is the Lord, Jesus has the authority and we must believe in Jesus. And the crowd that is gathered there in verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Right? And I read these two passages for a reason. Right? I read these two passages for a reason. Because it seems that, hey, that's a contradicting answer. In one, Paul says, just believe and you will be saved. And in one, Peter is saying that be baptized. Right? But you have to pay careful attention. Because the questions are not the same. The questions are not the same. The question in Acts chapter 16 is what must I do to be saved? Right? The question in Acts chapter 2 is what must we do? Okay? And the reason it's different is because we already made the case that, you know, just because we are saved doesn't mean our life ends there and we go to heaven. We are saved and now we got to live not as a slave to sin, but as a slave to righteousness, as an obedient servant to God. Right? So yes, what must we do to be saved? Believe. But what must we do after that? And that's why when Peter is asked the question, what must we do? He doesn't just say what they must do to be saved. He must also tell, he also tells what they must do after they are saved, right? And after they are saved, they are instructed to be baptized. And to tie it together, even uh, the, the jailer in Acts chapter, um, in Acts chapter 16, after uh, Paul and Silas says that, you know, believe in the Lord um, and you will be saved, that night, um, verse 33, at that hour at the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds then immediately he and all his household were baptized, right? So you see, salvation was dependent on the belief and the confession. But the immediate thing that they did after that was to be baptized. Well, think of it in the term of a relationship, right? If someone says that, okay, I, you know, let's take a romantic relationship or a, a man and a woman who are dating or the courtship and, you know, the... The man says to the woman that, look, I love you, you know, I want to be with the rest of your life, but I don't want to sign a certificate to say that we are married. I have commitment issues. I, I don't want to, I don't want to use a worldly label of marriage. I just want to be together, right? You know, and I understand that it's hip to say that these days. But the question is that if you're making a commitment to be together, then why are you afraid to just declare it to the law, declare it to the people, sign a piece of paper, shouldn't harm, right? But you would say that, hey, if someone says they love me and they don't want to sign it, they don't want to make that commitment, then maybe they're not sure of their commitment. Same thing applies with baptism. If you truly believe and you professed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, be baptized. Why wouldn't you be baptized? So 
I encourage you that if there's any one of you listening today, um, especially if you're a part of Windsor Gospel Assembly and you've believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that you've confessed to people around you that Jesus Christ is your Lord and that you believe that Jesus was raised from the dead, I encourage you to come and talk to the leadership. We would love, you know, I know it's the time of the pandemic. We can't gather together, but we would love to set up something where as soon as this is over, we'd love to for you to participate and be baptized. Make a public confession that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And, and if you're not part of Windsor Gospel Assembly or part of a different church or they're globally or hearing to this message some other time or at some other place, I encourage you to reach out to a local congregation, a local Bible-believing church and say that, hey, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe that God raised him from the dead. Um, I would like to be baptized and follow whatever steps to do and be part of a local congregation. So hopefully, I know I spent some time in that question, but I think it's important for us to kind of fully vet out that question because uh, it is something that is very important for us to understand. And hopefully you understood that Baptism is not a prerequisite for the Holy Communion, but baptism is a matter of obedience as soon as you believe, and you must do that. Okay? Um, so, um, there is a question that has come up. Um, um, that is, um, oh, I see a whole bunch of other questions are already there. I see that I was already baptized when I was a baby. Should I baptized again after I become a Christian um, or there's another question there it means that what if people think that the way you're ex um, explaining water baptism is one interpretation why is child baptism also not okay so these are the both same questions kind of they just came up uh, thank you for people helping me to keep an eye on this so I can address this together before we move on to the next question so I was already baptized as a baby what um, should I baptize again after I become a Christian? Um, so here's my answer to that. Why are we taking baptism in the first place? Are we taking baptism to declare that our parents decided to follow Jesus? Are we uh, taking baptism to declare that uh, our parents decided to raise us in the Christian faith? Or are we taking baptism so that we can proclaim to the world that I have decided to follow Jesus? And I would argue that uh, as a baby, you could not have made that decision and you could not have declared that. And so if uh, so, that's why child baptism is more of a commitment of the parents to raise the kids in the way of the Lord which is a great commitment to have, don't get me wrong. But the child baptism is not a commitment of the individual to follow Jesus. And that's not what the individual is declaring. You would argue that a three-year-old cannot declare that, or, or a three-month-old cannot declare that, whatever, depending on when your child baptism was. And so I would argue that, yes, um, you, can, you can take baptism again as an adult to declare in the congregation you are part of. Um, but once again, this is not a question of whether you're a believer or not. You know, if you're raised in a church, you're baptized as a baby, uh, but you've been a Bible-believing person who believes in Jesus Christ, you're saved. You're a Christian. I would call you my brother or my sister. So it's not a question about your salvation. It's not a question about whether you're going to go and be with heaven. But it's a question about what is it that you're professing in that ritual. I know other denominations have confirmation or other rituals where they kind of declare the individual's adult profession of following, I would say, why don't you just take the biblical uh, way of professing that and get water baptized? So that's my take on that. Uh, other question is that I was already baptized. Should I be baptized again after I became a Christian? I would say, yes, why is child baptism not okay? Once again, it's not bad because it's showing the commitment of the parents. But it's not the commitment of the child. And if uh, and I know some people may think that, okay, it's a silly ritual. I already believe in Jesus. Why do I need to do? 
But keep in mind, Jesus asked the same question. Now, some people say that, okay, I know my relationship with the Lord. Why do I need to subject myself to water baptism? Well, Jesus knew his relationship with his father. He still subjected himself to uh, water baptism to set an example. And I would say that that is a sign of humility and a perfect way to show that I'm putting my ego to death. I'm going to be dunked into a water in front of a whole group of people because I think Jesus is more important than what I think. And and I think that's why adult baptisms are amazing. Um, and hopefully that kind of wraps up that question as well. Okay, thank you once again, my host, for bringing this all to my forefront. Um, Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, the next uh, most voted question. Um, in regards to Romans 7.15, and I'm going to read that for the benefit of those of you who are listening. Romans chapter 7, verses 15. Um, okay, oops, in the book of Acts. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 15. Um, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate to do, that's what I end up doing. And if so, so it, obviously it's a very poignant passage. We kind of talked about this last week. We can dive into that. We end up doing the things we don't want to do, right? So, um, how can we not get back into the circle of sin? That cycle. Well, follow the. Uh, guardrails, be within the guardrails that God has provided to us in scripture um, to live a holy life. And the three things I say is, um, we actually kind of did a series on this uh, in our church. Unfortunately, that's not video recorded or live or a Facebook channel. It's like uh, maybe a year, a year and a half ago. So we were talking about how uh, being rooted in our relationship with God. Right, and we talked about um, three things. We created a three by three matrix for those of you who remember. Um, we talked about being grounded in the Word of God, which is reading the Bible, studying it, engaging with it. We talked about being rooted in prayer, which is pray, you know, not just together in fellowship, and being rooted in uh, the fellowship, in the gathering of the believers. These are three things that the Bible gives us. Right, uh, just practical steps. You know, we can, can talk theoretically, theoretically, like Paul already says, about the power of the Holy Spirit that sets us free. We've been empowered, we've been set free, we've been transformed in our minds. But hey, what are the practical steps? Well, the practical steps are this. Read your Bible, pray, and be in fellowship. Three things, always. I don't care where you go. I don't care if you move to a different land and you are alone, people worship differently. I don't care. Read your Bible, Pray and fellowship together. And it should affect your knowledge. It should affect your actions and it should affect your emotions. So that's the other three side of this matrix, right? Um, when you read the Bible, not just in your head knowledge, but it should also affect your emotions and it should also affect your decision making and your actions. When you pray, it shouldn't just be about venting your feelings to God. You must pray in order to understand who God is and you must pray to make decisions and act in accordance to God. And once again, fellowship, when you are fellowshipping with other believers, not just to have a good time, not just to have an emotional connection, but to actually bring them in to your knowledge and say, that, hey, can you teach me about this in the Bible and learn more? And hey, can you help me make this decision? This is how I'm acting. Can you help me make a better decision in my actions? So it's three by three matrix. I actually have a printout about that. Um, I'm going to share it um, on later on uh, to on this particular um, uh, question on our Facebook live comment section of this video and maybe you can address it. I'll post it in our WGA group and other places so hopefully you can address that. But simple answer, read your Bible, pray, be in fellowship. Okay, if you can do that consistently, God is saying that he will use those channels to constantly refine you and make you better and better and better. And once again, not just in your knowledge, not just in your emotions, also in your actions and behaviors and see how God works with that. So hopefully that addresses a little bit of the question that was asked. Now. Um, okay, so I'm going to move down to the next most voted question. Um, Jesus has forgiven our past sins, but even when we sin knowingly or unknowingly this time, 
uh, with the consciousness of Jesus, does Jesus still forgive us still then? Okay, so now the question is that, okay, Jesus forgiven our sins, but I sinned again, you know, whether knowingly or unknowingly, I've done something wrong. What's God's direction towards that? Well, God's direction towards that is that when Jesus died for your sins, he died for all your sins. Past, present, future. Uh, a very uh, beautiful, uh, poetic way of saying this is that the what happened at the cross has repercussions or has, has ripple effects for both sides of eternity right which means from the cross going back into history for people who put their trust in the messiah and also for going into the future of all of us who have and will put our trust in the messiah so uh, the cross ripples has this point in time which has repercussions for both sides of history past and the future and that our present moment as well so when jesus died for us on the cross he took the, on himself the sins that we will carry out in our life to come but what does that mean does he still forgive us of course he forgives us but does that mean we just live however we want of course not. we talked about the motivation motivation already but in the episode of john i'm going to turn to first uh, john first john chapter um three verses um nine i believe okay i'm gonna quickly research this i can't find the exact verse says he's faithful and righteous so okay first john chapter 1 verses 9 there we go um right um verse 8 if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness okay so if you know you have sinned go to god ask for his forgiveness it's not that Jesus is once again paying the price for your sins. He's already paid it. But you go to God and confess your sins so that the relationship between you and God can be restored. It's like if I hurt my family member by doing something wrong. I want to go and ask forgiveness so that I can restore the relationship and all the bad air between us is cleared. That's the aim, right? We're family. We're probably not going to go our separate ways because of a small hurt. But still, if we don't talk about the hurt at all, what kind of relationship is that? So we should talk about that hurt. We should confess our sins and reconcile with God. Say, God, I'm sorry. I did this. I don't want to do it. Please help me. Give me the strength to not do it again. Uh, make every effort to not repeat that mistake, of course. Um, but yes, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from our own our unrighteousness so my answer to that question is yes go to god confess your sins the bible also tells us in first james chapter and uh, james chapter 5 verses 17 confess your sins one to another right it helps us stay accountable it helps to get rid of that secrecy that is within us that the satan uses against us so confession is a big weapon that god has given now confession doesn't get rid of your sin let me be very clear of that confession is a process through which we get rid of the bad air that has been created because of our sin right the breakage in the relationship that has been created because of our sin it helps us reconcile with god and with others right what gets rid of our sin is the blood of jesus that he's already shed for us on the cross okay i want to be very clear about that hopefully that answers your question um okay Okay, so the next two questions kind of uh, tie to what I just said. So it's a perfect segue into that. And I'm going to read both of them together because they're linked. Um, I wonder if they were asked by the same person to kind of, so that I don't answer one side of the question, I answer it comprehensively. So um, how do we approach, approach a church member if they have hurt us? First part. Second part, how do I respond if a church member has approached me 
saying that I have hurt them. <laughs> uh, I like the question. Both sides of this, right? I like that question. So, but let's answer this both together, right? Um, how do we approach a church member if they have hurt us? Okay. Let me address the heart issue here, right? Let me address by saying why sometimes we do not talk about the hurt that has been caused to us. Sometimes um, the status quo is more important than us, than the relationship. Not ruffling feathers is more important to us than the relationship. Uh, just maintaining a pleasant superficial relationship is more important to us than growing into a deep honest relationship. And that's why we don't want to have these difficult discussions. That is not what the Bible says. The Bible says the aim is for us to be one united body. We just did our series uh, before this series of Romans about how we are this brick wall that is being built together. We are one temple, how God is placing us together, how love and honesty and loving, not just in words, but in actions is something that unites us as a church. How can we have superficial relationships? How can we want to have superficial relationships? So first thing is we should discuss the hurts, even though they are difficult conversation, we should. Now, how should we approach? Approach that person in love. If they have hurt you, maybe they were having a bad day and they hurt you intentionally. Maybe they hurt you unintentionally and they didn't even know about it. It's sad if you're holding a grudge against someone who doesn't even know that you have hurt them and you are not willing to talk to them. And it is sad if you know you have hurt someone, but yet you don't want to reconcile that. Because it shows on both sides that you are not interested in the relationship. That you are not interested in having love fix that relationship. So, once you have decided that yes, you want to fix that relationship, which is a good thing, which is I pray that the Holy Spirit brings all of us into conviction if we are not doing that, then I pray that you approach them in love and in grace. You are not going to tell them that the aim behind you telling them that they hurt you is not that they can fix the hurt in you. Trust me, they can never fix the hurt that is in your heart. Only God can do that. Only God can pour out love where there is hate. We try to defend ourselves and we add up, end up adding more hurt, more insults to injury as the saying goes. But only God can heal the hurt and take away that pain and reconcile relationships. That's a God thing, right? So your intention isn't that if I tell this person they hurt me, the they can fix my problem. They cannot fix your problem. So you are approaching them, not just from a selfish perspective of fixing the hurt, you're approaching them in order to help them be a better Christian, to help fix the relationship. To And so if you're, that is your aim, then do so in love, in gentleness, and in grace. And let me say this clearly, not because they deserve it, but because that's what your heavenly father expects from you. Right? And I want to be very clear. Right? Because that's what your heavenly father accepts, expects from you. God expects us to have honest conversations, deal with problems and resolve our differences and reconcile. If you're not doing that, then we are not really engaging with one another. So... Yes, go talk to the person who has hurt you. Please do so. But do so in love and grace. And prepare yourself. You may know that they're going to get defensive a little bit. Prepare for that. Still show them love and grace. Not because they deserve it, but because that's what God expects of you. Okay. Second part. How do I respond if a church member has approached me saying that I have hurt them? Right? So I want to... Before I jump into that, I want to wrap up another point about this. If someone has hurt you, go there with the mindset to forgive them. Right? Now, now we may say that, hey, they don't deserve forgiveness. But forgiveness is never deserved. It's never earned. Forgiveness is you deciding to not hold a debt, not hold someone to them having a debt that you have paid for them. You're just giving them a free pass out of your love and your grace. Right? I hear a lot on the internet these days about like, 
Oh, forgive them because if you hold on to the grudge, it hurts you. Yes, if you hold on to the grudge, it does hurt you. I agree with that. But that's not your motivation to forgive. Your motivation to forgive is to fix the relationship. Think of it, right? The Bible says that we must forgive as the Lord forgave us. Think of that. Did Jesus forgive us just because he wanted to get off the bitterness in his heart? No. Jesus forgave us so that we can be reconciled in our relationship with him. So we must not forgive just so that we can get rid of the pain in our heart. We must forgive because we want to reconcile the relationship. It's something for you to think about. I hope you think about that. Um, uh, how do I, what do I do if, um, if I have unknowingly hurt them and, um, okay, where did the question go? <laughs> what do I do if uh, people come to me and say that I have hurt them? Firstly, do not get defensive. Hear them out. They have been hurt. Validate their hurt. They may be wrong about it. They may be wrong about your intention. They may be wrong about um, what you did. They may have been misinformed by someone else. It may have been a rumor. Fine. But express love for them that, hey, at least... I understand that you feel hurt. How can I help? You don't have to lie. You don't have to take responsibility for something you didn't do. Um, don't lie to fix the problem. That's just going to create the problem worse. Uh, don't admit fault for something that you didn't do. But be graceful. Don't get defensive. Don't attack them back. Don't start reminding them of all the times they have hurt you. No, no, no. Deal with it the way God expects of you. Love, kindness, gentleness, and grace. Jesus came to us full of uh, truth and grace. That's how we ought to do in truth and grace. And if it becomes a he said, she said situation, depending on what you guys are discussing, remember God is part of this relationship. God has an opinion. Go to God. Both of you must seek to get God's perspective on this. Okay. Once again, if, and I want to be very clear here, if, if I have hurt you guys with what I say from this podcast or personally please come and talk to me tell me i've hurt you um, and and hold me accountable to the things i just said that um, help me see if i've done wrong and think of it the bible says that if you see someone doing wrong and you point it out and they repent because of that you won a brother back like why wouldn't you not want that share what's on your mind be open and honest i'm going to move on to the next question All right Um, the others are not as weighted, um, kind of talk about things. If, I'm going to read all the questions, try to address some of the things that is completely different, something we haven't covered this evening. Um, what does waiting on the Lord mean? Um, in the context of marriage or any other similar important decisions that you might have to take. Okay, Waiting on the Lord. That is a difficult question, especially with the context that has been given. You know, um, there are big decisions that we make in our life, right? Some of you may be graduated and haven't got a job for two years. Um, so if you have been praying for a godly partner and there's nothing in sight, right? Um, waiting on the Lord means... Not that God will answer your need as per your timing. That's not what waiting on the Lord means, right? Waiting on the Lord means that you are putting your hope in God rather than putting your hope in what God gives. Let me say that very clearly again. Waiting on the Lord means that you are putting your hope, you're trying to find your satisfaction in who God is and how much he loves you and how much he knows your needs and how much he knows your timings and finding hope and satisfaction in the fact that God loves me. 
He sent his only son to die for me. What else would he will he withhold from me? Being absolutely certain of that. And using that assurance to deal with the pain of the difficult situation. And I want to be very clear. It is a very difficult situation. Whether it is loneliness you're going through, whether it is financial pain you're going through because you don't have a job, whether it is a difficult relationship in your marriage or a difficult relationship in your family, you're going through and you're waiting, Lord, when will this family member come to saving grace of Jesus? When will my spouse become a believer? When will I find someone whom you have sent my way that I can marry? When will this loneliness go away? When will I find a job where I don't have to depend I don't have to struggle from from one meal to another. These are all difficult and painful situations. I agree and I understand and I completely validate that struggle. But God's grace is more than enough. His grace is sufficient for you and is sufficient for me. And we are reminded in Philippians that in any situation, we can be content because I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Waiting on the Lord means not holding God accountable to a timeline. God, my biological clock is ticking. Oh, my friends have all graduated and got great jobs. Oh, you fixed their marriage. God, why? What is your time? Is your clock broken? When will you listen to me? And I understand in our pain, sometimes we cry out to God like that. And the psalm writer, David, does that. So... Venting to God is something we can do. I understand that. However, waiting on the Lord means that God knows better than I do. Right? Um, there's a song, and that's the perfect song I want to point you towards this. Right? It's a song by this singer called Johnny Diaz. And it's a song called Waiting Room. If you haven't heard that song, go and hear it. And I encourage you to find a version on YouTube which has the lyrics there so that you can hear that, hear that right? And it's a beautiful song. And uh, I'm going to just tell you that the chorus of that. Um, here, let me see if I can pull that up. Okay, here's the chorus of that, right? For you have a much better purpose and you have a far greater plan because you have a bigger perspective because you hold this world in your hand, right? And the verses of this song are equally beautiful. Um, I want to read one of them. You know, I love this song. Um, um, the first half of the song. Here in this waiting room, yearning for you to say go. And though I am convinced that a yes would be best, this time you're telling me no. It's not that I don't have an answer. It's just not the one that I'd like. But through this time, Lord, I must keep in mind that you're always wiser than I. Oh, I love I, I love what God does through the Christian community in poets and authors, whether it be the hymn writers of the ancient or whether it be uh, the early hymn writers, Fanny Crosby and such, you know, Joseph Scriven and Horatio Spafford, amazing hymns, whether it be Hillsong or whether it be the songs you guys write, God is amazing in declaring his, his emotions through songwriters. I love that. Listen to the song, uh, Waiting Room by Johnny Diaz. Okay. Um, I'm going to pick a few questions. In quick succession, I feel these are more theoretical questions. And once again, if you have deeper questions about this, reach out to me on a Zoom call, message me on Facebook. We can talk face to face. Um, we can uh, address more of these questions. Um, um, is Christianity supposed to be called a religion? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> and the reason I say that because the definition of religion changes in context of a conversation. So if you hold true to the definition, the technical definition of a religion is something that binds us to a set of rules towards achieving something. When you are bound to a set of rules towards achieving something, that's technically what religion means, to bind, right? And in that sense, Christianity is not at all a religion. Because we just talked about last week that there's not a bunch of rules you have to follow to please God. We are not even living based on a bunch of rules. 
We are living the freedom of the spirit. We are not bound to rules. We have been set free by the transformation that comes from the renewing of our mind um, to be free. So we are not bound to anything. We are living freely for Christ. Right? We are bound to him if anything and not because we are struggling to be free but because we can freely live a life pleasing to him. So by that definition Christianity is not something that binds. It is something that sets free. Therefore, Christianity is not a religion. Bruxy Kavi, he's a pastor of a church in Toronto, the Meeting House. Uh, he's a teaching pastor. He wrote a book called The End of Religion. He talked about how Jesus came to end religion, but obviously he's using the very technical definition of religion as I just did. But in the context, people also use the word religion to identify world religions. Right? There's Hinduism, there's Sikhism, there's Buddhism, Islam, there's Christianity. So what in that context the word religion is being used to categorize uh, groups of faith that people uh, it, it is used to uh, identify faiths that do groups of people adhere to. In that sense, yeah, Christianity is a religion, right? So if you want to say that um, yes, Christianity is a religion because you know, I strive to live in a way that pleased to God and I've bound myself to Christ. Sure, Christianity is a religion. If you say Christianity is a religion because just like other people follow different world religions, I follow Christianity because Jesus is the only way and hope. He's the way, the truth and the life. Yes, Christianity is a religion. You could say, yes, Christianity is a religion because uh, James says in the book of James that the true religion is to take care of the widow and the orphan and meet their needs. Yes, Christianity is a religion in all those senses. But you didn't say that Christianity bound you and made you tied to a bunch of rules. You just said that that's how you live in a Christian way. And that's fine. So if you use religion as a loose sense of what it is, that that's your way of living, that that's your world uh, uh, affiliation in terms of world faiths, Sure, Christianity is a religion, but in the sense of the true definition of the word to bind or to tie, to tie you to something, no, Christianity is not religion. Jesus came to set us free and we are free indeed. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, any new questions haven't come up, so I'm going to see a few more. Um, why did God create the nation of Israel and separate them from other humans? Doesn't this look like he is showing favoritism? Um, so keep in mind. God didn't choose Israel because he liked them best. God didn't choose Abraham and his descendants because Abraham was the best behaved person. We are, we are told that Abraham uh, comes from a land of idol makers. So there's nothing saying that Abraham lived the perfect life. You know, he did a lot of things that record in scripture that we wouldn't agree with and that God wouldn't agree with. And about Israelites, God constantly says that you're a stiff necked people constantly disobeying me. Right? God actually wanted to purposely choose a stiff necked people so that he could show that he wants to save them through grace and he wanted to use them as a template so that his grace and his gift of salvation apart from the law could be displayed to the world through the nation of Israel. Israel doesn't have an advantage in the sense of salvation that Gentiles don't have. We have access to the same God. That's why Paul says, as we read last week, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. In Jesus Christ, we're all saved because of us putting our hope in Jesus. And that's what we do. And so in that sense, God is not showing favoritism. Actually, Israel got held to a much higher standard because they were chosen by God. So um, they were subject to a lot more of judgment of God in that interaction as God played out the story. But their salvation individually and as a nation always was based on grace which was a message that God used for declaring his grace based gift, gifted salvation to the world so I don't see it as favoritism I see it as God using one nation to reach out to many yes they started thinking that they were better than others but God doesn't necessarily say that in terms of their own righteousness Rather, we read in Romans everyone's a sinner first three chapters right that's what we've been discussing. Um, so no, it's not favoritism, but yes, God did single them out to get a message, use them as a stage on which he could play out his um, act to show the world that 
salvation comes through faith alone through the grace of God. Uh, where do other religions fit in with regards to sin and what about the solution they offer? So in answering this question, I would just like to categorize all world faiths, all world religions in two categories, right? If the solution is based on what I can do to earn God's favor and salvation, then they're all in one category. And if it is based on that I can't do anything, but but someone else has paid the price and they are saving me, then that's two different categories. Because in the first category, and once again, some Christians live that way, that I'm going to earn my heaven by obeying God. Okay? And I know Hinduism talks about that, the karmic uh, reincarnation cycle. Buddhism kind of takes a similar take since it came out of Hinduism. Um, Sikhism has its own set of rules about like, you know, getting rid of pride, getting rid of anger and violence and uh, attaining moksha or attaining nirvana, pleasing God that way. Islam has its pillars of Islamic and your good deeds have to outweigh your bad deeds. Now, any other religion comes down to the same thing that, hey, if you follow this way, if you meet the requirement, you learn heaven, right? Or faith-based empowerment will help you to earn heaven. How are you taking it? Still based on you earning it. Christianity says you can't earn heaven, you can accept it as a gift. And all of these solutions, right, give glory to the person who is being saved, that that person earned it. This solution gives glory to God, that he has alone saved us, right? That's why Christianity stands so unique to all other world religions. And I'm not going to dive deeper into that, but that's something we can explore in later classes or a new series if you would like to do that. Um, okay, I think I have covered all questions. Um, okay, a few new uh, jumped up. I'm going to quickly try and answer that. It's almost... Uh, 8.45, a few minutes, and then we're going to dive that. Um, but this question starts with a but, so I'm assuming it's tied to something I already said. But in the Old Testament, the Lord took Israel's side at the cost of other nations' lives. Isn't that favoritism? Great question. Great question, right? So what does it mean to take Israel's side at the cost of other people's lives? I would say that statement is based on an incomplete reading of scripture. Because you could argue that when God used Nebuchadnezzar or God used uh, the nation of Midianites or God used any of the other nations to pass judgment on Israel, you know, those nations benefited while Israel was the nation that died and perished. Right? So was God really taking sides in terms of life and death? Right? No, God used whoever, Israelites or the other people, to kind of get to the point across that it was he who decided life and death, right? As God always does. So whether we decide we die of old age or we die of a car accident or we die because of a pandemic pandemic, or we die because of something that, like something that happened in the Old Testament, God is the only one who gives life and takes away. So just because someone died doesn't mean God was on not on their side, right? So I want to kind of clarify that. So God is not showing favoritism by who dies and who lives, because even righteous people die, and even evil people live. Sometimes righteous people die early and evil people live long. You kind of find that in the book of Ecclesiastes, where the um, writer, the teacher in the book of Ecclesiastes kind of says that, you know, time, um, chance, um, happens to everyone, right? Uh, time and chance has happens to everyone and it's, we don't know what's going to happen, whether you're good or bad, right? And we see that in the book of Israelites as well, that, you know, that yes, all the other nations seems to have died, but, you know, if you read the history of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he could have, you could have seen that, hey, Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, Babylon prospered because Daniel was there, right? Uh, Egypt prospered because Joseph was there, <laughs> So think of those things. So did Israel really prosper? Israel had famine and Egypt had plenty. So we got to see it in the entire context. We can't just tunnel vision on one aspect and say, oh, I'm going to judge God based on that. So hopefully that kind of provides a little broader perspective to this question. 
uh, how are non-Jews before Christ uh, forgiven because of the crucifixion, right? Well, we kind of talked about this, uh, but I'm going to reiterate. They put their hope in the Messiah that was about to come. We see in, and we see hints of this in the Old Testament. The first hint is in the book of Genesis, where God tells to the um, woman that, yes, childbirth was going to be painful, but the seed of your womb, the child that is going to come from the generations out of childbirth, will crush the head of the serpent, right? So we're already given a promise about someone who's going to be born, who's going to crush the head of the serpent that led or tempted humans into sin, who's going to deal with the problem of sin itself, right? So people have been waiting and hoping for that Messiah. Um, we see in um, in Moses' time, when people rebelled against God, there were snakes that came down, and as a punishment, uh, people died out of poisonous snake bites. And once again, God declared that they were going to die because of their sin, and as he does with all of us. Um, but Moses created this bronze serpent on a pole, and anyone who put their trust or looked towards the bronze serpent, which is pretty much a confession that, hey, I'm like that snake who's turned around and have my poisonous tongue spews complaints against God instead of thanking him. Anytime he was confess their sins and look towards the him who was raised on the pole, that Jesus became that one who became cursed on our behalf, raised on the pole. Those who put their trust in Jesus will be saved. So there are hints, even in the Old Testament, and that's why Abraham put their faith in the coming Messiah. That's why Jesus said, Abraham knew me and he put their faith, his faith in me. Right? And they wanted to stone him for that. But so the Old Testament Jews also put their hope in the coming Messiah. We also put our hope in the Messiah that has already come. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The only answer, he is the one who saves us. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. I am going to wrap up our Q&A night here today. I don't see any new questions popping up, but thank you for those who kind of collected questions from different watch parties and posted it on the app or inform me on the handouts or whatever. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully these Q&A nights are a time when you will truly look into your own heart and have more of these questions and discuss these questions amongst yourself. Remember we talked about being in fellowship, not just to sing songs and pray together. Discuss scripture together. That's what Bible studies are for. And I know we're doing a deep dive into Romans, but I love your questions and your interaction and the comments that pop up while we're talking because it helps us make sure that we're targeting the questions that you have, okay? And and we're going to have more of these Q&A nights and please keep sending your questions, hopefully. And once again, if you want to follow up on these in a deep dive conversation with me or with Pastor Monsi or any of the church leadership, reach out to us. We would love to discuss these things and uh, guide you from the Bible and learn from you because sometimes you're unaware of the questions that you have and maybe it's things we've never thought of and it helps us to engage at that level and help God transform us in another understanding and grow deeper in our understanding of scripture. As the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. Hope we do that in fellowship. I'm going to close in prayer and once again, thank you for joining us. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for the Q&A night that we had. Thank you for all the questions that you laid on the hearts of the people watching. Thank you for everything that was discussed. God, I pray that each and every one of us will go deeper in our understanding of Scripture. Of we will pursue the answer to these questions. And we, like the people of, uh, like the Barians in the book of Acts, we will validate everything that is said through reading scripture through prayer through discussion that we will grow deeper in our understanding of who you are and how you expect us to live thank you lord for giving us a technology that we can have this in the midst of the covid 19 pandemic and separation god we pray for those affected by this pandemic you will be with them we pray that we will find creative and new ways to uphold each other in the midst of this dear god and god we pray that your spirit will take this video and the answers and the discussions and make it spiritual nourishment for many others not because of my words or my intellect but because of the power of your spirit that uses unqualified people in miraculous ways god be the hope of this nation just as you are and we pray god that we will continue to give our glory and honor 
to you and you alone, dear Jesus, because it belongs to you alone. And it is in your beautiful, matchless name we pray. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us this evening. Um, this video, as always, will be on our Facebook uh, page of our church uh, on the video section. Always can go back and reference it. Uh, I will post uh, that uh, handout I talked about and the waiting room song that I mentioned. Hopefully that encourages you as well. And if you have any follow-up questions, um, reach out to me. If you'd like to be baptized, reach out to the church leadership or a local church. Um, and once again, I encourage you, engage with one another. Talk about your hurts. Talk about these discussions. Form honest relationships with each other. God bless you. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's joyful to know that we are connected even though we are physically separated. Let's continue to do this. God bless you. Thank you once again.